if you really want to start talking about what inspires me, what kind of gets me going, and hopefully you'll see sort of the ripple effect in, in the work, um, it's the area I grew up in. It's eastern Washington, northern Idaho, southern British Columbia and Alberta. It's all about the big landscape. I do believe that most of our creative sort of bank or, or most of our creative sort of savings comes from our youth because those are quiet times, those are learning times, those are times that you can always go back to. And the interesting thing is, especially in architecture, it's not the magazines, it's not the books, it's not the academic teaching or the grounding that you get at school. Those are all important things to sort of teach you how to become creative or how to do sort of magical things, but they're not the source. And that's probably one of the main points I want to make tonight, is that the sources come from other places. And they don't come from me, they don't come from architecture, they don't come from, from books. Um, I, you know, I, I was saying earlier today, I'm 57 years old, at some point you, you're reflective on your light, life and you understand where those, where, where those uh, inspirations come from. We're in probably one of the most fantastic landscapes on the face of the earth. We've got the rainforest here on the wet side and we've got the dry side over in, um, over in the central, um, uh, sort of central and east Washington. It's an unbelievably, believably varied landscape. And again, for us as architects, because our buildings are in landscapes, that's actually a pretty interesting source and a rich source for us to work with. This is more my kind of background. It's the Palouse, it's the, it's the Cooley, it's basically the Cooley River, the Cooley Dams, the Cooleys. Um, that sort of big landscape, kind of lonely landscape. I actually think some of the, my most important sort of moments as a kid were those moments that I was alone, I was in this landscape, which a lot of people that don't grow up in that, that environment think uh, is all that interesting. They almost think it's kind of boring. And over time, if you live in all four seasons in that landscape, what you slowly begin to discover, it's not, not boring at all. It's all about the nuance. It's all about the poetry. It's all about the experience of living in that, in that big landscape. I didn't realize this until a few years ago, how important mountain climbing was for my architecture and is as actually a sort of a source of inspiration because it's not only the landscape, but it's how you engage that landscape. And that clearly is what architecture is about. How do you engage that landscape? And what do you use to engage that landscape? And mountain climbing for me, one thing I learned from uh, very good climbers that I was privileged to, to, to climb with was the more elegant, the lighter, the faster your climb is, the more successful your climb is. It's not about getting to the top, it's about how you get to the top and how you manipulate the gear, the, th the, the thinking, the patterns, the sort of understanding of the weather, understanding of gravity, understanding of all those sort of issues, those sort of physical issues that um, affect your ability to elegantly and, and uh, uh, gracefully climb a mountain. Hot rod uh, industry was a big deal uh, when I was uh, in, in, my, um, in my youth. These guys did something that I think we all in the creative fields are supposed to do. And they're not given the credit for the courage that they, um, that they took by doing something that was actually a big part of what it is to be creative. And that is to take a risk, to take something that's a commodity, a car, and personalize it, actually modify it to a pers personal vision. And up in the upper left, that's, um, you know, that's Ed um, uh, Big Daddy Roth, and uh, that's his car called Beatnik. Or no, is it Beat? Yeah, no, it's Bandit. I think it was called Bandit. And it's actually kind of a horrible, horrible looking thing in, in, in many ways, but it's a personal vision and it's a risky vision on his part. He dedicated his life to it. The guy below him is uh, that smiling Tommy Ivo. And this is all intuition, this is all seat of the pants kind of uh, farmer's physics kind of going on here. Tommy Ivo had this idea that if one engine would go fast, maybe four engines would even go faster. It was a complete disaster because there was so much heat that would be generated by the four engines, which were almost impossible to balance, that he would burn his head every time he, every time he drove, the, um, drove the car. This is supposedly not done by creative forces, creative uh, culture, but in fact I find some of this stuff to be the most inspirational because of where it's coming from and because of why people do it. Uh, an interesting point about the salt flats, um, 
There is no sponsorship. Oh, there is some sponsorship to some of the some of the uh, some of the cars, but there is no prize money. So everything you see that runs on on the salt flats is own, is there for one thing, and that's to experiment with the idea of going very very fast. So that was super important for me, both as pro, uh, understanding that my role as an architect, as a creative, is to poke the culture out there, but also to also make the stuff so that it becomes, uh, becomes real in the real life. There is no way in a short life you'll figure out everything in our profession. So as you, it really is sort of an old person's profession, you really do become a better, better architect as you, as you uh, grow older into the profession. This is not really a young person's profession. And I was about 38 years old or so. This is the time where I finally became mature as an, as an architect. And I want to kind of make that point really clear. Before that, I mean, literally from when I graduated when I was 23 years old to about 38 years old, I'd say that I was still very much in the mentor sort of learning part of my, of my career. And I don't think I hit my stride as an architect enough until I was probably 38 years old when I was lucky enough to hook up with, with this client um, and work on her house. So you can see, again, this, uh, you can see the projects, the, all the projects are relatively simple. My budgets are, tend to be relatively uh, low. And, that's, and the way that you can control budgets in architecture is keep the building kind of simple and edited and straightforward. And again, uh, you know, that's what I learned in mountain climbing. That's what I learned from working with artists uh, making things that actually had to build those things. And that's actually what you also learn from people that are hot riding. What are the ideas? What are the essential sort of reasons for what you're doing? And then make them as elegantly and as simple and as straightforward as possible. So you'll see all the work that I kind of go through here as being relatively simple, straightforward, and, and hopefully edited down to what, what the essential sort of idea of the, the project is. Here you can see the building um, in elevation. It's obviously a big studio, big room for um, uh, her work as a photographer. Um, that's a shifted access entry um, off the backside, so it's very private off the backside. Obviously, it was real transparent off to the big view. Um, use as many natural materials as possible because the nature of materials are that they're interesting inherently and they also age with time and time is probably one of the most important things we can deal with as architects because the aging of things um, is probably one of the more interesting things for me working as an architect. You're not overworking materials, you're not making materials do something that they don't do naturally because as soon as you use materials in a natural state you've already made a, an enormous stride in the sustainability of, of that strategy because it, it is what it is and you let it age, you let it sort of morph with its, own, with its own sort of life. If you begin painting it or you begin sort of covering it, you've, you've, if you start thinking about it, you're thinking about all the, that work to do that and then all that work to maintain it. Um, if, you embrace, if you embrace a natural material and you embrace a um, natural maintenance in a way, you've already made huge, huge inroads. So I always try to talk about natural materials with clients, the way they are, you know, let them happen the way they do. But also it's just simple things like, like a farmer positions a barn. You know, a farmer would position a barn in the most environmentally smart way. So the, the animals were warm, they were protected, they, they faced into the wind, they were protected by the wind. And that's what we do just natural, as a natural course of business. That, um, the view may be to the west. I mean, that's obviously important. But how do you take that and then sort of morph the rest of the building to sort of understand what's the best way to um, act naturally on, on the land?